Good morning, Redemption Peoria. Welcome. So let's look to God's word as it calls us to worship. This is Psalm 102, 25 to 27 from the NLT translation. It says, this long ago, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you will remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them. We all say together, but you, you are, are always, always the same. same. You, you will live, live forever. forever. So the unchanging king of the universe is ready and willing to walk with us today and every day. So let's go to him boldly as we sing these words and ask him to be our vision.
and falls, whatever comes, God is still our king. And we know this, you know, sometimes here, hopefully here, but we also know that so many of us are struggling. So maybe you've been separated by many of your loved ones um, due to periods of quarantine or, or other social restrictions. Maybe you're like me and all of your family is in a different state and uh, you think about them maybe more than you uh, usually do. And uh, maybe the stress and uh, worry you felt over the last several months, or what feels like a long time, has just become too much for you to bear, or maybe uh, things just don't feel like they should. So let's remember that we can bring these things and, and everything else um, before our Father. He loves us, He cares for us, He asks us to bring us uh, ourselves. He knows our own hearts better than we do. Pray, Lord, ruler of all things, we are harassed by doubts, fears, unbelief, and spiritual darkness. Our hearts are full of disquiet and skepticism. We're bitter, and we long for normalcy to be restored. It feels, at times, Lord, like you're distant. We feel separated from you, and even when we know better. Help us, Lord throw ourselves wholly and completely on you. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Tell me you need him Lord, I need you Oh
defends my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. One defends our righteousness, not ourselves. Jesus, that's who. Hear the good news and be assured. This is Romans 5, 1 to 2. It says this, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through which we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So not only do we have peace with God, y'all, but we have peace with one another. So let's greet one another with the peace we have from Christ. Jump in the chat. Call people, tell them you love them, do what you need to do. Let's go ahead. John chapter 10, starting verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life, have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Redemption, Peoria, good to be with you once again, wherever you find yourself. We're thankful that you are watching, and we hope that God will meet us together through the power of His word and the power of His spirit as we're on a screen once again. Um, we celebrated Easter last week. It was great. Uh, for those of you that were able to make it in person, we were in the gym on C3's property, and we were able to do one service, so every single person got to be under one roof celebrating the resurrection together, which was really cool because we have two services normally, and we don't always get to be fully together, and we got to do that last Easter. So thankful for you guys that came out. That was in the gym. We will continue to meet in the gym um, if you happen to be with us in person for the next three weeks. Um, for the month of April, we'll meet as we're restoring the chapel, the, the space that we normally meeting here on the property. And then we will be back May 2nd in the chapel, and we're going to celebrate the new space by celebrating baptisms. And so if you are a follower of Jesus and you are a part of a community and you have yet to be baptized, man, we would love to have a conversation with you about what that might mean for you to be baptized and make that commitment in that celebration. It's going to be a really, really sweet Sunday on May 2nd. So let us know. Reach out to us if you have questions or reach out to your community leader if you have questions about baptism and are curious about that. It's going to be a great, great time. Well, if you have a Bible, pull it out. We're in John chapter 10, picking back up in the Gospel of John. We actually started the Gospel of John in August of 2020. So we've been slowly working our way through this gospel. It's the fourth gospel in the New Testament. There's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then John is not a part of the synoptics, those first three that are somewhat similar. But John is a little different. It was written about 30 years after those. And 
John writes with a different vibe, and there's no parables told in the Gospel of John as Jesus teaches through a bunch of parables in the other Gospels, but John uses these pictures and these images and these I am statements throughout the book. And so John chapter 10 is a chapter you should really know if you're trying to investigate who Jesus is or if you know who Jesus is and you need comfort and a reminder that he is good and worth following. John chapter 10 is chocked full of it. We're only going to go through the first half today, this week, and next week we'll go through the back half, John chapter 10. So open it up. And uh, as we've been seeing, Jesus in his interactions with these people, the Pharisees, the religious elites, they have been going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what the author of the Gospel of John does, John, is he writes and he tells us the purpose of his writing. Actually, at the end of the book, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says, I write these things that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that in believing in him, you would have eternal life. So the whole purpose of the gospel of John is to put you face to face with Jesus, to decide, to make a decision. Is he really who he said he is? That you would believe into him and that in believing you would have life, you would have eternal life. And so he puts this in all these different scenarios with these different people that he interacts with in in the gospel as we've been moving through this to chapter 10. And one of the groups of people, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. And Jesus and the Pharisees don't get along. I mean, they have continual beef that starts in John 2 when Jesus walks in and flips over the tables and says, this is not how this should go. And it continues to escalate. And we saw in John chapter 5 that He's not following their rules. And they're saying, why aren't you following our rules? Because Jesus heals somebody on the Sabbath. And it really makes him mad. He continues to have this dialogue back and forth where he's claiming to be God. And the Pharisees do not like it because it disrupts their sense of control and their sense of power. And really, following Jesus disrupts all of our sense of control and sense of power. It's true. And so what we're going to see today in John chapter 10 is this final debate that Jesus has with these Pharisees. It's been escalating over the chapters. John has been doing this intentionally to get us to this point where Jesus and the Pharisees have this final debate about leadership and what it means to follow somebody the right way. The tension is definitely high as we're going to look at this text together. Well, I have one biological brother. He's a year and a half older than me. I have step brothers and sisters on both sides of the family, but I only have one brother that I actually grew up with. And when he was 10 years old, my dad, our dad, gave him a book called Catch Me If You Can. It's based on a true story about a man named Frank Abagnale Jr. Maybe you've seen the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. And the purpose of this story in this book, this man's life, is he was kind of this young con man in the 50s and 60s. And he flew on planes and he pretended to be a doctor and he did all these things. Well, my brother is an impressionable 10-year-old. My dad gives him this book and he decides this is how he's going to live his life. And my brother is really, really smart, but he wants to beat the system because he doesn't like the system. He doesn't think it makes sense and he's smarter than the system. And so he does all these crazy things. He has a crazy life story. After high school, he decided he wanted to become a Navy SEAL and went out and enlisted in the Navy and was going through Navy SEAL training and blew out his knee and ended up um, getting kicked out of the Navy because his knee was so bad. From there, he went to SeaWorld and he trained Dolphin for a couple years. And after that, he got a contract with the military to train Dolphins how to sniff bombs. He, he just has a crazy wild story and he's a crazy wild guy. And uh, he re-enlisted a couple years ago actively in the Navy again. And about a month ago, he became chief, which is, it's kind of a big deal for the Navy to be a chief. And so he was telling me about some of his interactions and his interview process when he was potentially going to be a chief. And one of the things they asked him, and maybe you've been in rooms like this when you've been interviewed for a position, they asked him this question. They said, what do you think is the biggest qualifier of being a leader? What's the biggest qualifier of being a leader? And some of us might think, well, character or drive or determination or influence or, you know, maybe intelligence. And so they asked him that question. They said, what do you think is the biggest qualifier of 
being a leader. And he just looked at him kind of sarcastically and said, well, followers, <laughs> which is true on paper that you need followers to actually be a leader. And if you have followers, if you have influence, you are leading someone. And I think most of us have some type of influence. Now, I'm not talking about just being a CEO and that's how you kind of define leader. I'm just talking about having influence on somebody. Maybe it's your peers. If you're a mom or a dad, you have influence and leadership over your children. Maybe a coworker you have influence and leadership over. Almost all of us have some type of leadership built in to our lives. Well, not only do we have leadership built into our lives, we also have the idea of following people built into our lives. Because all of us, all of us follow someone or something. That's how we're built as humans. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not. You follow something or someone. And businesses will pay buckets of money to advertisers to spin their product in such a way that you would buy in and you would follow them and buy their product. We all follow something or someone, and many of us lead at some level. And who or what we follow, who or what we follow will determine what kind of life we leave. Who or what we follow will determine what kind of life we lead. That is just true. And that's what we're going to see in this text today. And when Jesus talks about following and leading, he uses a specific example in this text. He uses sheep as people, as the followers, and shepherds as the leaders. He uses sheep and shepherds. And the reason he uses sheep or shepherds is because this would actually ring true and it would make sense for the people he's talking to. Now, remember the context. He's talking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees. And sometimes in church, if you grew up in church, we kind of give the Pharisees a bad rap because we know what they've done to Jesus in the story. But at the time, these were the pastors of the day. These were the religious elite of the day. They had status they had power. They had a sense of control. People respected them. And Jesus uses this language because they knew the law. They knew the scriptures. And so they would resonate with this idea of sheep and shepherd because it's talked about in the Old Testament. And when you think about the Old Testament, if you're familiar with it, you might be going, where does it talk about sheep and shepherds? And maybe the first thing you think of is Psalm 23 which is the most famous psalm in the Bible, and maybe even the most famous passage in all of the Bible. We studied it this summer after the pandemic hit because we needed a good shepherd. Let me read it briefly to you for those of you that are not familiar with it. This is what would be ringing in the ears of the people that Jesus was speaking to, talking about sheep and shepherd. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever." This was the picture of the good shepherd and the sheep and what it means to be cared for by God. But there's also another passage that the religious leaders would identify with when talking about sheep and shepherds, and it's found in Ezekiel 34. It might not be as familiar to us because what's happening is God is sending his prophet Ezekiel because the people of God, the leaders of God, they're not leading like they need to lead. They're not leading as God has called them to lead. And so God sends his prophet to realign them, to call them out, to help them understand what they're doing is not okay. Let's look at it. Ezekiel 34, verses 2 through 4. It says this, Son of man, prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophecy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel, you have been feeding yourselves should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. Verse 4, the weak 
you have not strengthened. The sick, you have not healed. The injured, you have not bound up. The strayed, you have not brought back. The lost, you have not sought. And with force and harshness, you have ruled them. That's a pretty blunt description of God's leaders doing the wrong thing. And more than anything, I think they would identify, the religious leaders that Jesus is about to tell about sheep and shepherd would understand this, and it would be like right in the backdrop of the words of Jesus. And if we all follow someone or something, and who or what we follow determines the way we live our life, it would make sense for us to follow a good shepherd. And that's what we're going to find in this text as Jesus unpacks his description of how he leads his people. He's a true shepherd. He's a protecting shepherd. He's a good shepherd. He's a missional shepherd, and he's a risen shepherd. Those five things we're going to see in these couple of verses as we look at it. Jesus is a shepherd worth following. Let's look at John chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Jesus says this, He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out all on his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus is saying that he is the true shepherd. That he knows the sheep, and then the sheep know him. They understand his voice. In verse 4, we see that he leads them out and he goes before them. There were two different ways you could shepherd in this time period where you could lead out, as Jesus is saying. The picture, the imagery is that this shepherd comes in and he calls his sheep and the sheep come to him because they know his voice. And if a false shepherd is calling the sheep, they won't go to them. They will come to the true shepherd. And as they go out, the shepherd leads them. He leads in front of them. The two ways you could shepherd at this time was you could lead in front. As Jesus is describing, you would be the one in front of the danger and you would have your sheep follow you based on your voice or you could lead from the rear, from the back. And you would take a staff or a rod and you would kind of smack the sheep and you would lead from the back, pushing them in front of you, which is not the way that Jesus leads. And the way they can understand the true shepherd is because they identify his voice. And I don't know about you, but I know my dad's voice. I can recognize it. I can think about it right now and think of how it sounds. And my kids, they know my voice because of how I sound and because of proximity, because we've been with one another for so long. And in verse 5, it says, A stranger they will not follow. They will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And anytime I meet a little toddler for the first time, and I'm a, a stranger to them, and I'll, I'll say, Hi, they, they typically they don't run to me, and they don't hug me. They typically are a little confused and, and suspicious, and they usually do what? They cling back to their parent, the voice that they do know. And so it's imperatives for us to to walk and follow a true shepherd is to know his voice. Do you know your shepherd's voice, your good shepherd? If you're a follower of Jesus, do you know the voice of God? How do you tune your ear to hear that voice? My wife and I used to work in college ministry, and all the time when seniors would come up to their senior year, and they're confused about what they're going to do, where is God leading them next? And they're like, I just don't feel like I've heard his voice. Typically, when I sit down with a senior like that, it's because they haven't really been listening to God until this moment. They haven't been spending time with him. They haven't been developing their relationship with him. And so, of course, they don't recognize his voice because they haven't spent time with him or They've got some other situation that's clogging their ears, some type of sin that is not allowing them to hear the voice of God. And then they're confused why God won't speak to them. It's like, well, you haven't been spending time with him. 
You have to spend time at the feet of Jesus, reading your Bible, being with Jesus' people, singing, loving Him to understand and hear His voice. Because He is the true shepherd that we desire to follow. Let's keep reading. Verse 6 says, This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what He was saying to them. This is a shocker. Not, not really. If you've been following, Jesus says something and the Pharisees are like, what? I don't, I don't understand. And so Jesus gives a different version of this story. He's not only the true shepherd, but he is secondly the protecting shepherd. Let's pick up in verse 7. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life, have it abundantly. This shepherd that we're seeking to follow, not only is he true, he's a protecting shepherd. He gives life abundantly. Jesus says here in verse 7 that I am the door for the sheep. And, and the picture is this, when they would get their sheep and they were traveling somewhere, and they would make this little tiny pen and then instead of having an actual door, the shepherd would physically lay down as the door in protection. I remember when my kids were little and I would lay on the floor with them, kind of blocking, especially when they were toddlers and they were trying to figure out how to run and crawl and all types of things. And I would literally lay by the door or by the stairs so that they didn't have access to things that were dangerous for them. This is the picture that Jesus is given, he lays down his life. He becomes the door in which people come in and go out. Any enemy that's going to come in has to go through him. And he won't let the sheep go out on their own because he's a protecting shepherd. And he says he'll go out and he'll save and find pasture for the sheep. He puts you in the good places that you need to grow as a sheep. Verse 10 says, the thief comes to only steal, kill, and destroy. And I came that they may have life, have it abundantly. Typically, when we read that verse out of context, John 10.10, 10, it's pretty well known. And people talk about the thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Typically, they think of the devil, the enemy, Satan. But this is actually geared towards religious leaders which is crazy. This is actually geared toward Ezekiel 34, the people that Jesus is talking about. Listen, I gave you this position of power and influence and you are abusing it because you're here to kill and steal and destroy. But the good shepherd, not the harmful shepherd, but the protecting shepherd, he comes to give life, give it abundantly. This word abundant in the original language in the Greek, it means over and over and over again. It means more than necessary. I don't know if you guys have ever been to one of these Brazilian steakhouses. Fogo Jutau was the first one I went to. I was up in Minnesota at this work trip years ago, and we went to this place, and it is abundant and excessive. Even for your wallet, it's crazy. It's like 80 bucks to eat at this place. It's nuts. I wasn't paying. It was on somebody else's time um, for my work. But I went there and you sit there and it's this Brazilian steakhouse where they come by and they bring you the unbelievable cuts of meat. And you have this coaster on your table and one side is red and the other side is green. And you leave it green and they just keep bringing food and keep bringing food and keep bringing food and they'll just cut it right in front of you. And it's so good. It's over and over. It is more than necessary when you eat there and you walk out feeling so full. And the good shepherd is offering abundant life. So, so full. Let me ask you a question, Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus, is your life reflective of an abundant life? Or are you just tired? And I'm not saying being tired is not an indicator of following Jesus. Don't hear me say that. I'm just saying following the shepherd, he gives life. He gives it to the full. He gives it with abundance. And some of the problem I think we have when we read this scripture is we take the American context and we overlay it with the Bible, which is always a dangerous thing to do and hard for us not to do, honestly. But we read that and we say, okay, what would an abundant life look like? What would an abundant life look like? If you think about it, if I asked you that question, you might think, well, I mean, I'll, I'll pay off all my bills. 
I'll get a new house. I'll have a car that actually works, finally, a car that works. I'll be fulfilled in my romantic relationships. I'll have the white picket fence, and I'll have two kids and a dog, and I'll have the husband or the wife, and I'll have all those things. I'll have a lot of money in my bank account, and that is kind of how we view the life of abundance because of the American ethos, this upward mobility. That's what we think life is in abundance. And it's not... It's not. That's not what Jesus was talking about. Life is so much richer. It's so much fuller. And it has nothing to do with your physical stuff. I love how Paul talks about it in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 3. Listen to what Paul says about this idea of having abundance or this abundant life that we somehow have dreamed up in our mind. Listen to what Paul says. He says, starting in verse Three, the end of verse 3 of chapter 3, he puts no confidence in the flesh, like in his own effort, in his own power, in his own control. We kind of think abundance will be our own power, our own control, our own wealth. He says, I put no confidence in the flesh, verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's saying, I have the abundant life, <laughs> right? Verse 5, are you circumcised on the eighth day? of the people of Israel, to the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. He's saying, listen, I have climbed all the rungs of the ladder to get where I want to get. But look at how he defines it in verse 7. But whatever I gain, I had. I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I, what, may know and gain Christ. Father of Jesus, this is the abundant life. It is knowing and following Jesus. It's not all that stuff that we just talked about. It's knowing him and being in right relationship with him and walking with him. That is the abundant life, and that is what the good shepherd offers you. He's a true shepherd. He's a protecting shepherd. And third, he's a good shepherd. Verse 11, back in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not the shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is the true shepherd. He's the protecting shepherd. He is the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. He puts himself in harm's way for the sheep. And anytime you're leading someone else, the good, true mark of leadership, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or whatever, is that you care more about the people that you're leading than you do about yourself. And God's leaders, the Pharisees in Ezekiel 34 and now are saying, no, 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 we care more about ourselves, our power, our control, than we do about the people that we're leading. And Jesus says, that is not okay. It's bad shepherding. But I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. The hired hand, who's, he's describing these religious leaders. You guys are like hired hands. This is just a gig for you. This doesn't really matter. And when that happens, when danger comes, what does the text say in verse 13? They flee and the sheep get snatched by the wolf or the sheep scatter. And you've seen this in people, religious leaders, that they don't care about the flock more than they care about themselves. And years go by and you find out things that, that aren't true and they're not good. And this is what happens. The sheep scatter or the sheep get devoured by the wolves. And Jesus is saying, don't follow those types of shepherds. Follow me. Follow me. I will lay my life down for you. Jesus doesn't run away from danger. He stays to lay down his life for the sheep. And he's not going to leave you. 
Maybe you need to hear that this morning. Maybe you, you feel like Jesus is absent, and he's not. He's the good shepherd. He has his eye on you as his sheep. He loves you. He's going to protect you. He is good. Some of us have kind of Jesus attachment disorder. You know, when, when a toddler is growing up or a baby is growing up, they have attachment disorder, part of the development of their brain as I understand it. You, you know, when a mom is holding a baby and then, you know, she hands them off to get a drink or something and she's still near the baby, but the baby can't see the mom and it'll start freaking out and crying and because it has an attachment disorder. It thinks the mom has gone away forever and sometimes we feel that way. In our relationship with God, we look around at our circumstances and we feel like God has left us. We're alone. Things aren't happening how we want them to happen. And we feel like God has left us. He hasn't. He's a good shepherd. He's not leaving you. He'll care for you. He'll protect you. We have to be reminded of that. So Jesus is saying that he is the true shepherd. He's the protecting shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Verse 16, we'll see he's the missional shepherd. Verse 16 says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock with one shepherd. Jesus is the missional shepherd that goes out and gathers his flock together. And as Revelation 7, 9 tells us, at the end of all things, it will be all tribes, all tongues, and all nations worshiping the one true God. He goes out, he leaves the 99 and goes for the one. He cares for people that are outside of his perspective and he brings them into the fold as only a good shepherd that's missional would. He's the true shepherd. He's the protecting shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the missional shepherd. And last we'll see in verse 17, he is the risen shepherd. Verse 17, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. To follow Jesus is to follow a risen shepherd that is alive. He lays his life down to take it up again. And we celebrated this last week in the resurrection, that this is true. And I love verse 18. No one takes it from me. He's saying, listen, if you follow me and I'm good and I'm true and I'm loving and I'm missional and all these things are true, you might want to take advantage of me and kind of begin to kind of push me around and boss me around. But actually, don't get it twisted. The sheep don't tell what the shepherd to do, even if the shepherd's a good shepherd. And this is what he's saying. Listen, uh, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on purpose as a sacrifice because the Father has called me to do it. And it's good that he's a risen shepherd. And some of the reason we need all of these things is because we're looking to follow someone or something in our life. And we can follow something true or we can follow something false. We can follow something protective or we can follow something harmful. We can follow something good or we can follow something bad. We can follow something missional. We can follow something stagnant. We can follow something risen or we can follow something dead. I need to follow a Savior that has risen, that has beaten death, that brings dead things back to life. I need that. I need to follow something that is good. I need to follow somebody that is true. And Jesus fits all these things as a shepherd. Let's look as we close up the last three verses of this section, verses 19, 20, and 21. And it seems like there's always like, um, there's these intense interactions and Jesus says some really good stuff and then there's like three or four verses at the end of a passage that to me kind of seem like transition or, or maybe like throwaway verses like why, why are we saying this? But John is packing something in these last couple of verses that I think it's important for us to pay attention to as we turn the corner next week. Listen to what it says in John chapter 10 starting in 19. There was a division among the Jews because of these words and so Jesus lays out, listen, you are not good shepherds. You're thieves, you're robbers, you want to kill, you want to destroy. I am the good shepherd. And he lays those things out. And there's a dispute or a division because of that. Verse 20, many of them said, he has a demon, he's insane. Why listen to him? 21, others said, these are not the words of the one who's possessed by a demon. How can a demon open the eyes of, a blind, of the blind? 
Verse 20 is so interesting to me when we talk about following and leading. Because what's happening is Jesus is pushing up against the religious leaders in this moment. He's reminding them of Ezekiel 34. He's saying, listen, you are not okay the way you are doing things. How's their response in verse 20? Man, he's a demon. He's he's insane. This doesn't make any sense. Why would we listen to him? So my question for you, if you are in a position of leadership, which many of us are at some level, and somebody comes and gives you feedback, gives you some type of correction, do you have the humility to listen to it? Or do you quickly start to call names and like, man, that that person's crazy. You can't trust him. I don't know what they're talking about. This is what's happening to the religious leaders because they don't have the humility. They don't want to give up their control. They don't want to give up their power that they think they have. And they just start calling Jesus names. Then in verse 21, the others, not everybody feels this way. Some of the others have the humility to say, well, wait a second. Let's look at his, what he's done. These are not the one, the words of somebody who's possessed by a demon. How can a demon open the eyes of the blind, which is dritching, or, or dripping with irony and kind of this uh, kind of playful jab that John gives? Because in John chapter 9, what happens is that Jesus heals a blind man and lets him see. And then the Pharisee says, well, what, are, what about us? Are we really blind? And Jesus says, you are. And so even in this last passage, this last verse, it's saying, listen, can a demon open the eyes of a blind No, but Jesus can, and we're blind, and we need Him to open our eyes. We need a true shepherd. We need a protecting shepherd. We need a good shepherd. We need a missional shepherd. We need a risen shepherd. Would you follow Jesus in the midst of being all those things and more? I pray that you would. I pray this would encourage you as you think of what does it mean to know his voice and to hear it? Would it encourage you that he holds you, he protects you, he's with you? Would it encourage you that he's never leaving you, that he is good and he's taking care of you? Would it encourage you that he's going after his own, even if it's you and you don't know him yet? Would it encourage you that he is risen and that he's beat death so that we can know the Father again? I hope it would. I pray we would walk with Jesus for a lifetime, men and women. Let's pray together. Father, would you help us see you? Would you help us hear you? That we would know your voice and that we would follow you. That we would not follow false shepherds. We would not follow bad shepherds or harmful shepherds. God, would you wake us up to who or what we are following Because who or what we are following will determine what kind of life we have. And we want to have life abundant found in you, connected with you. Jesus, you need to do it. We ask that you would. We pray it in your name. Amen. Thanks, you guys, for continuing. Let's continue to sing to this good shepherd about who he is.
as we bless one another, as we do all the time with our benediction. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, or y'all. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you.